All right, welcome everybody. It is George Leoniak here at New Geometry, and today I'm very excited to have a special guest, uh, Britt Edwards. He is a really a great facilitator of chelantic science, and uh, that's related to the crystal spiral and uh, cathar grid. Uh, some of you might know that I have a quite a light, lot of videos on that already in a playlist all about cathar grids, crystal spiral. And I think Britt and I got together maybe, uh, I guess we realized it was one year ago. So this has kind of been a long time coming. He's been checking out my videos. He's a real supporter of uh, my work. We're always sharing some texts back and forth or uh, messages occasionally. So it's just really great to have him here. And uh, we're gonna kind of do a combination between you know a lot of Britt's interest and in research. I mean, he's so heavily into the geometry and the science of this. So I'm thrilled to have him here. He's gonna really share some enlightening insights to a lot of the other material that I've shared. Uh, and then we're gonna go through a little bit of my material that I've worked with too and kind of mix it all together. So Britt, how are you doing today? Fantastic, bro. Thank you so much for having me. It is honestly an honor to be on this channel with you. Uh, for I really respect your work. Uh, for all those watching, I've been watching George's work and very keenly every video you put out, like I make sure to watch it because I know that the way that you're coming about it is the way that we all need to come in about it. And that's curious, you know, that's, you know, open and neutral in all perspectives. And I love your work, bro, really. So I'm a student of your work and appreciate it. And I'm excited to share my work along with your work and we combine it into a synergized unified field of knowledge that will greatly expand anybody's perspective on sacred geometry and exponentially you know when they get through this video so that's uh what I, my goal is and i feel like that's what your goal is too and yeah oh, i appreciate you bro yeah, no, that's totally beautiful. That's really well said. And uh, yeah, you're really in for a great treat, you know, uh, what we're going to be bringing here to the uh, the table. You know, really, because I really kind of approach sacred geometry from uh, phi ratio, power of life. I mean, a lot of my videos are integrated around that. And uh, it's really nice to connect with Britt because uh, we really found a common ground to work with in the relationship to the sacred geometry and uh, kind of transcend any differences and kind of put aside some of the, the, uh, the, the difficulties that might be around the flower of life and things like that. We're gonna talk all Basically about Basically personal opinions and we just got to the true mechanics of how does it connect, Yeah, you know, so, yeah. Great, so that's what we're gonna, we're gonna kind of get into that material and Britt's gonna share uh, more on all that as we go. Uh, we do have a bunch of slideshows, Britt's got some material. So, you know, unless we have any more to, to say, I say we should work with the slides and kind of riff off of them. Uh, as, right. you know, uh, well, I will say before, basically everything that we're gonna be showing as far as sacred geometry and lines and angles, this is just representations of spirals of energy because that's all life is. It's electromagnetic, plasma, holographic, fractal reality. So this geometry that we're showing you is a language that corresponds to your DNA and because your DNA is inherently geometric, you know what I'm saying? It's the language of light and sound. So the geometry that we're showing is ratios of light and sound and basically that's it it's not just shapes on a on a paper or computer it's our energy field our bio field the template that matter forms on you know stuff like that so uh if george if you can start with your diagrams i feel like would be perfect as the base foundation to start with yeah, exactly. Well, we'll start that one. And, and I just want to add one piece of that is like, as we were describing kind of prepping for this video, it was really just more or less the what we put on the page or on the computer screen is really a matter of perspective. And I think you'll hear that a lot throughout our, our video is that, you know, my early videos on this was about shifting the view of the the square view or pentagon view and all that sort of stuff and showing, well, these are really matters of perspective. And that does relate to your energy field when you're definitely drawing something. So these are things to really consider. And we leave that up to the viewer to, to decide right. as you relate to it. And, and I think Britt will share more on that as you were talking about fear and stuff like that. But we'll save that a little bit for now until we get right. into it. 
So let's uh, let's share the the first one because this is really one of my favorite uh, slideshows. I'm just going to bring up the whole slideshow that is already out there. Um, that uh, was a really. I think this is probably the one maybe where you contacted me right after this one came out. It, it, this, after I saw this video, I knew I had to get in touch with you. <laughs> Yes, because we talked a lot about, and this one is all about the octahedron, right? So this is, uh, right. and Britt was really works, you know, and he'll describe with the octahedron, the eight-sided uh, shape, you know, with the, the equilateral triangular faces. Right. And, you know, you, this is one where we're actually looking at an octahedron right here, and it looks mm -hmm. flat, right? You know, it's, right. it's totally flat, and I built this model and put the spirals into this. But here's just the next image is, well, here it is rotated as an octahedron that's instead of looking at it this way, I just turned it so the equilateral triangle is facing you and all those right. spirals that are attached, well, they just moved with the, with the shape. So right. anyway, and, Britt, and I want to start getting that, that. The way that you did the pyramid, each of those pyramids are fractalized and double. So that next pyramid on the inside of the octahedron, if you, if you show where you're inside the picture, yeah. Yep. Yeah, the next one. Yeah, that smaller pyramid to the bigger, that's two times smaller because of the ratio, the flat template that it's based on. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Britt's saying, well, like uh, that, this other octahedron in here is two times smaller than the, the larger diamond shaped one here to this, this right. rotated one here and down to that one there. Right. Uh, and, and then you've got the uh, the squares within there, right? Which could also be cute. I mean, there's so many ways you can look at this type of shape, right? right? It could just be an octahedron. This could be cute, an actual cube that has another dimension to it. So this is one that I think really kind of shifted the, uh, the view and the perspective uh, for me. And this was the inspirational video that got Brit, I think, as we said, in touch with me. <laughs> sure, 100%. So yeah, where do you want to go with this one? Because we can keep, uh, I can keep thumbing through. Let's just see um, where, so here's the octahedron again, and you right. can see that here's the squares that are in here. This is what they look right. like tilted, right? So I want to say with this diagram, people will notice, right? So when we talk about, you're going to hear us talk about perspective a lot. So I feel like this is if you took a cube, and you shifted it 45 degrees. And why do I say 45 degrees is because that diamond that it produces is an, is are two equilateral triangles put together, right? Essentially, you know what I'm saying? Like if you was to put a horizontal line through that, that would be an equilateral triangle set on top and the equilateral triangle set on bottom. Right. And so what I've discovered is that the equilateral triangle, could you zoom into that top right diagram? This one over here? Yeah, that top sure. right one. Yeah, yeah okay, zoom, hold on a second. Zoom into that. I want people to, because I've recently yeah. discovered something pretty amazing. Oh, there we go. So that's basically the star David or the Merkaba six-pointed star within a six-pointed star within a six-pointed star. Like base, ba perfect fractalization, what Dan would call perfect implosion, you know, the way that they're nested inside of each other, right? Yeah. Well, so when you put equilateral triangles together, they lay flat. They don't extend in the 3D, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. even though this is a grid, a 3D represent a 2D 3D representation of a cubic grid because it's made of equilateral triangles it lays flat you know what I'm saying it doesn't extend into 2D mm -hmm. you know but but it's still 3D so I, I feel like this is a matter of information conveyed because shapes are information and how your brain is picking up that information and how it's conveying i feel like maybe that's something that's important that people don't realize you know what i'm saying because your brain can produce images it can uh, pr uh process data you know what i'm saying it can produce topology you know your brain waves are sine and cosine and tangent mm -hmm. so i feel like it just simply because it shifted in this view the somehow the geometry gets compressed mm. you know what i'm saying it's compressed flat because it's all equilateral triangles not that it's actually flat because we know this is the same view as the 
Cathara octahedral grid, right? Yeah. So, well, you, you know, the, uh, the hexagon in and of itself, I mean, is uh, basically there's no platonic solid that has a hexagon. Right, right. right. exactly. You start with an equilateral triangle, let's just say, you fold it up to a tetrahedron. You fold it, right. you create a five pentagon cap, right? You right. start with the square, you put those together, right. you fold us, you, you create a cube. <laughs> That's exactly. what you can get with that. If you do so, with hexagons, you only get the dodecahedron. So you don't, exactly. your hexagon is flat. You, and this is a hexagon view. <laughs> right. There's no question about it. Flower of life, seed of life. It is all about the hexagon. So everything in this is really a flat plane. It is representing three-dimensional objects, but right. it is a flat uh, perspective. So, and I feel like, I feel like that is the only really problem or difference is because as you see, the octahedron is made of equilateral triangles. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So the Cathara grid is made. So the equilateral triangles, I guess, would be planes. You know what I'm saying? Would be representations of flat planes. Mm -hmm. And if geometry is made of invisible planes put together at certain angles, then the template, when it goes into that hexa view, there's, there's information lost or something like that. And then when you look at a square and you got uh, X, you know, going in it from the diagonals, those are right angles, right? So we see right angles and we geometry and we're like, can you go to that Cathara grid and the uh, uh, Merkaba? Yes, yeah. Right, yeah, right there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Below. Uh, this one. No, the one below it. Oh, this one, we're the two together. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So when you see those right angles, right, you're looking at right angle triangles, mm -hmm. right? Well, what I realize is those right angle triangles are equilateral triangles, mm -hmm. but they're at 45 degrees. And when you tilt an equilateral triangle 45 degrees, it morphs into a right angle. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So the equilateral triangles are part of sacred geometry, but I feel like they're not like it's like trying to take a piece of paper right and you and you cut the equilateral triangles and you fold it into a pyramid right how i sent you that video yeah so flat the template itself flat the plane is equilateral triangles put together to create that flat plane mm -hmm. but the geometry itself is that plane folded or put together or it's more than one plane you mm -hmm. know put together so i think what they're trying to do is get us looking at one side of the pyramid and thinking that is the whole template. Like that's the whole geometry template when really that's only one part of it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Is that? Yeah, different? well, I think, you know, I always work from every perspective and draw from every perspective. And, you know, this is yeah. because I think that there is information that you will see and discover from another perspective that you won't um, see from, from another view. So I don't limit myself in any way like that. Um, I do know that operating, when, when I go to construct a form, you know, if I'm going to build something new, for instance, I get a lot of my measurements from this uh, square view that I call right. it here on the right. Because what happens with this uh, view is that the front and the back are the same. Like the fr front exactly. lines and the back lines, they line up. So this square that you see, like this equilateral triangle, you're seeing the front and the back is like a wire frame structure through it. So you see the front and the back, same thing right. with the Pentagon view. But this view, these lines, if I had them in here, the, up, the cross that I'd make in these, well, that's the same lines that are on the back. So I'm able to get very precise measurements in this view for very complex forms. I always go to this view. Right. There's something a little, uh, let's just say, less distorted about it in, in some ways to, to right. get the measurements, you know? Right. So I feel like what we would call that view is middle side view or middle top view. So mm -hmm. that view of the Cathara grid, even though it's square, that would be the side view of an octahedron with the point. You'd be looking at the point vertex, right? Yes. And so that top pyramid would basically, so if you was to turn it, 90 degrees and turn the side to the bottom it would still be the same view it would be a recursive view yes. no matter which point you turn it at mm -hmm. right yeah. whenever it's on the vertex that's what would happen just like right. just like this right right 
Exactly. So if you turn it like this, well, then it's like that, you know, it's exactly. like this. Uh, you could so we would call that corner view, and the star David would be face view because the equilateral triangle is the face of the pyramid. You know what I'm saying? So here we have, you know, uh, are you able to see my screen? Yeah, I can I see. Know. Yeah. Okay. So here we have, you know, the cathargrid view. Well, if you turn it on the face, well, you just see that equilateral triangle, right? Well, if it was a wireframe structure, you would see the other equilateral triangle on the back face, and that would make the Star David view. Yes. Yep. That's all it is, is a matter of looking at the face of the octahedron or the corner of the octahedron right. or the face of a cube or the corner of a cube. That is the only difference between the geometries, personally, in my opinion. Oh, I, yeah. Well, I, I mean... The Cathar grid of the cube is a square, right? So then right, you have the face, right? But you're going to have the vertex, uh, you know, right. corner view when you. So it, it goes back and forth between the cube. On the cube is the face view, is for yeah. Cathar, and hex view is corner view, right? Yeah. Yes. And this makes a big difference, though. And I've always thought about this in terms of the energy body of spirals moving around the pyramid structure or the tetrahedral Merkaba structure because right. you've got the vertex of uh, different for each of those forms so is the octahedron you know right. the uh, vertex oriented up people call this the diamond uh, body of lights you know and right. this fits the cathara structure or is it the vertex like this because these don't really go together vertex to vertex oh, like they, this. They, they, no they well, actually what we found what yeah. we, me and my friend found, this is what I wanted to share with you on the video, yeah. is this, this is a Sapinski fractal pyramid, right? Yeah. So each face is, this is an equilateral triangle mm -hmm. and it has a central triangle and it has a smaller triangle in this one. And I'm, so, I'm gonna put a smaller triangle so it'll have these fractalizing triangles, right? Well, I was like, well, where the hell did these, how are these triangles made? Okay, yeah. I was like, well, how? Why are these triangles on this face? And what I realized is that there's a cube in here. The corner sticking out there, the corner sticking out there, the corner sticking yeah. out there. This yeah. is octahedral, right? Yep. The cube is nested in there at 45 degrees right. with the corners of it sticking out. Yeah. That's how the cube fits. So the cube is a dual of the octahedral. Yeah. And the star tetrahedron is a dual of the octahedral too. And I'll show you how that fits too. But so the cube sticks out. And so this equilateral triangle that would stick out is just the corner of a cube. That's all it is. Oh yeah. No, I mean, that's total. I mean, I'm, of course I've shared that in my videos a lot and, and I have when I, when, when I, because that's uh, the compound of the two, basically, is what exactly. you're describing. And I'm looking yeah. for, I'm looking for well, the model. But, but what that is, is that is the Cathara grid when you turn it from its apex, because it creates the square within the square, yeah. within the square. And that is the view. So it's, that's what that is. Well, yes, of course. I mean, that's exactly what I was trying to share when I was showing the spiral following the points of the cube rotating around within the octahedron, right. <laughs> different, different size cubes. And we have, sl have slides of that too. I'm trying to find my little model, but you know, essentially that creates the, uh, the rhombic dodecahedron, you yep. know, because uh, if this is the vertex of your, let's put it in this orientation, right? Right, right. If, if this is the, what we're looking at here on the right, right? Right. So mm -hmm. this point four corners are the cube that, you know, right. was just being described. And now we've got the other vertices of the octahedron. And then uh, these make the rhombic faces when you put uh, it all together, right? So all you have to do is link together your uh, square and octahedron, and then you create the rhombic faces. So 12 dodecahedral structure, 12 faces, rhombic faces, of the fusion of both those forms. And this exactly. will then fill space infinitely. And this is the form that I ended up with to be like, if I'm going to represent something that infinitely fills space as it relates to the Qatar grid, this would be like the geometric structure. So that, that would be the link between phi and 1.618 polytopes in dodecahedra and the Qatar grid octahedral root two because if you think about it if 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 the octahedra is made of equilateral triangles right and mm -hmm. each face is a 60 degrees well that means 
because in Keylogics, we distinguish between Christo, Christos grid and base 12 geometry and base 12 Merkaba mechanics from Metatronic, quote unquote, is the Merkaba spin ratio. So on the planet, there's what is 34 over 21. And you know, that's part of the Fibonacci sequence, 34 over 21. And so it's 34 magnetic, 21. And you're like, what are those numbers? Well, that number is the spins per nanosecond. So yeah. it's 34 trillion cycles per nanosecond as to 24, uh, 21 uh, trillion cycles per nanosecond. So it's a cone of energy spinning 34 trillion times and another cone spinning 21 trillion times. And that's really what the numbers represent are the cycles per second. So the faster something spins, the more energy it's able to draw in because the spinning comes from flashing mm -hmm. and the flashing is the frequency. And the frequency goes up as it flashes faster and it's more dense and more compacted when it flashes smaller. Mm -hmm. So the difference between Christos geometry and Metatronic is Metatronic is a 34 over 21 and Christos is 33 and one third, 11 and two thirds. So 33 and one third electrical and 11 and two thirds magnetic. And mm -hmm. that's the spin ratio between electrical and magnetic Merkaba ratio. That is the only di difference between. So the crystal spiral would represent the 33 and one third. And I was like, how does a two to one spiral represent a one to three energy ratio? And I realized that the face of the pyramid is where the ratio of the Merkaba, because this, if this bigger triangle was one, this would be, this one would be one, this one would be one, this one would be one, one to three. So mm -hmm. it's the one to three ratio Serpinski fractal. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. Face would have that one to three ratio, and that's where the Ruche comes in. And mm -hmm. I'll we'll show Ruche in Yeah, we'll show that in just a moment. Uh, I just wanted to this this rhombic structure though, um, just going way back to where this just because the dodecahedron this this still doesn't make the link to phi this because this is still going to be based on root two. Uh, and root really? three of the cube and the octahedron. We haven't introduced the phi ratio to these yet. Um, the, really the way the phi ratio shows up in a lot of these, the way I've understood it is you have to add, uh, you have to basically take your octahedron and add four more octahedrons. So, you know, so, and they, they radiate out in a way that will create uh, the icosi dodecahedron. This is this shape, icosi dodecahedron, is six a uh, five five octahedron give you all these vertices. They're all really? rotated in it in it together. And my next video is going to be a lot more about this form. But there's five octahedron in this. It's a compound of five, just like the cube is made of a compound of uh, you know the dodecahedron is made of five cubes. So everything goes from you know one cube, one octahedron to five when, when we're working with anything really related to a form based on phi. So. Gotcha. So, so you're, I didn't know that, man. Thank you for telling me that. So you're taking five octahedrons and you're compounding them on them. Are they rotating around the axis? Are they nesting into each other? Are they stellating? Well, they are, are uh, that would, that would be called the, uh, the first stellation, uh, I think of the rhombic tricontahedron, it, 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 but the, so each of these vertices, when you put five octahedron that are equally, you know, spaced, they're kind of following the rules of geometry, they'll come up and they'll clear, create equilateral triangles and pentagons. And then you have five octahedra in this. And you, you could have five cubes compounded in there and five rhombic dodecahedron. I mean, it really starts to take off. I mean, but that's a really big leap you know, from going oh, from one, one, right? you call that the rhombic. Uh, this this one is the icosi dodecahedron. It's basically icosi dodecahedron. Okay, that is a very important polytope, and we're going to unfold that later. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, I it's my it's a big subject for my next video for the viewers. Check it out because it's going to really. I think this is a very very important polytope that doesn't get a lot of airtime <laughs> but it's right, a good, really important. good we're going to give it some important because that how how you connect phi to octahedron i feel like is 
what Keylontics was trying to explain in the mechanics, you know what I'm saying? The difference between the energies and how they're put together. I feel like that's what they were trying to explain, but they went dogmatic with it. They went like pointing fingers and names and like, this is evil instead of just showing the actual energy mechanics and the geometry. So I feel like yeah. that's very important. Well, yeah, I mean, you, we'll get into that a, a little bit more. And I think, I think that, you know, looking at the different perspectives, like it just, we'll just connect this to some of our uh, slides here. It's like, well, that right. spiral, you know, will follow, um, follow this hexagonal structure. You know, right, I put right. it right into these flower of life uh, patterns and connected the dots, you know, very skillfully and mindfully to figure out, to make sure it all lined up because it's going to hit these key intersection points on right. the octahedron edges. So, right. you know, it was like, that's how you follow it out to connect the dots. And then I could transpose the spiral to this whole new view. And it's basically like looking at a galaxy <laughs> from one perspective, you know, at an angle to you, like yep. tilted compared to just looking at it flat. And that, that's kind of what I came up with, uh, you know, geometrically after all that study. Um, and I think it's just, if you could say a little bit and, you know, you said so, a little bit before, but this I pattern, wanna... this flower of life pattern is really, be, in my view, become really divisive in the language and probably turns a lot of people off from getting into even looking at optics, you know, or they, they gravitate it to it so much because they love that. Um, but the way we're talking about it is that maybe one view has some different energetic resonance. People can discover that and find out there for themselves, but right. it's really working with geometry. It, these are just different views and perspectives on paper <laughs> and, and that represent the three-dimensional realities and objects or four dimensions, five dimensions. That's all it is, is presenting here. So there's nothing wrong, as you were saying before, maybe you want to say it to your, your crowd. Yeah, so basically what, what I want to, I want to ask, have you ever drawn the crystal spiral with a compass? Have you ever actually drawn that with the compass? Yes. Right. I've got a whole video on it. No, no, no. I'm saying like, so the curve of the crystal spiral comes from a circle. So each of those curves yeah. that link on the Cathar are actually circles, but the circle is scaling down yeah. as you're going inside the spiral. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So with this view, all it's doing is you're tilting that circular, perfectly circle scaled spiral and you're tilting it and it distorts a little bit. And then since it's in a hexagonal view, it's just compressing it to make it flat. So I feel like the only difference is this is just flat information as composed to right angles, which in your brain knows topology or topologically are equilateral triangles at 45 degrees. So when you look at right angles on flat pieces of paper, it is actually encoding 3D information. Yes. The, you know what I'm saying, but if you look at flat hexagonal geometry, I feel like it's just encoding flat information. That's it. It's still the same language, but the language isn't extending into 3D space. And I feel like that's really the only different factors is the angle that you're looking at is either corner or face. And does the geometry encode 3D pyramidal information or does it encode flat compressed information? So mm -hmm. from metaphysically, that's all I can distinguish between the geometries without right, knowing. Right, but, but the, the only other thing I'd say to that though is if we're, if we're really just working with uh, pyramidal geometry as a four-sided pyramid. Yeah, exactly. Compared, but, but, but compared to uh, tetrahedral pyramid, right, with three, well, yep. then you're back to the hexagon because, no, no. It, it, because that's the, the hexagon view. It's got the equilateral triangle and then you've got the the, the of pyramid of the triangle coming towards you in the hexagon view. So right. it, it's whether you're dealing with a three or four, it, six or four, three or four, four really is what it, in my mind, comes down to what pyramid shape you're focusing on. Because well, see, when you put this pyramid into a square view, though, then right. we lose the, uh, the pyramid coming towards you like that. True, true. Well, see, this is what I want to ask you. Have you found the connection between the octahedra and the tetrahedron. Well, remember this, if this was a compound, if we put both of these together, this would be the right. cube and this would be the octahedron connected right. to it. 
right. so you know, but, in so, the tetrahedrons. Yeah. So you see that there's an octahedron on the inside of a tetrahedron, right? Yes. Okay. So I wanted to show you this. Well, maybe we're we done with these slides. Let's go out of this share because I don't think All there's right. more in these. Um, yeah. Let's see. Let's see your uh, do some mod. If you want to show some models and stuff, this is a good time. Yeah, I wanted I wanted to show this model, right? Let me change the view so the viewers can see you fully. Go ahead. Yes. Can you see? Yep. Yep. No, you're on full screen now. Yep. All right. All right so this is an octahedron that I built, right? Yeah. So this is the views. This is what anytime you see a square, you know what I'm saying, with this diagonals basically it would be encoding octahedral 3d information yeah okay so on each corner you get the same view over and over and over again right. all right and on the face you get the star david you know but due to perspective this one's going to be bigger than this right, one right. Because, you know perspectively but yeah. 2d they would be compressed into flat you know equilateral triangles well i built this I built this star of David, uh, I meant the star tetrahedron for my girlfriend about three years ago. I actually welded it. It's made of stainless steel and I painted it. It's very, very heavy, <laughs> super heavy. Um, and what I noticed, this is, this is when I first got into geometry. I mean, this was three years ago. Uh, I was like, man, I want to, I want to build me a Merkaba. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I built it and then I was like, well, how am I going to set it down? So I set it down and I realized, whoop. I realized that each face, you know, that there was an X, you know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. On the face of it. And I was like, wow, that makes a cube. So this is an actually a cube. And since this is a cube on the inside of this, these will be the points right. or the corners of the octahedron. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. So the octahedron will be inside of this, and then the cube would be outside of there, and then it would be a bigger octahedron exactly. yeah. outside of this. Right. And I was like, okay, well, that's the octahedron inside of the star tetrahedron. Well, how does the star tetrahedron fit with the octahedron? Right. And so I had this just sitting up, you know what I'm saying, on my table. Right. Mm -hmm. And then this, remember, I, I built this one month ago. I built this three years ago. And then I set it and I was like, wow, let me set this on here. <laughs> you built and then the I realized, <laughs> wait, let me, uh, yeah, I love it when this happens. This happens all the time when you're following the trail. Things just happen to work out, <laughs> right? And so it actually, it actually fit. Yeah, you see? Yeah, no, I see that. Yep. Okay, it actually fit in there, and I was like, well, okay. Oh, wait well, a second. Is... Wait a second. Wait a second. Your screen. Uh, we just lost the screen. Oh, start video. There you oh, go. Bam. Uh huh. And so I was like, wow. So this fits in there, right? Yeah. And I was like. Well, since this since this goes this point goes inside this octahedron, yeah. well, is this the center of the octahedron? And yeah. so to test that, what I did is I took rods and I took rod and I lined it from this vertex to that one, that one, and that one, that one, and that one. And where the rods met in the center of the octahedron, this actually touches directly on yeah. the center of this octahedron. Yep. And so if you're looking at this, you're looking, well, this one sticks out like that. Well, if you was to put another star tetrahedron, yes. would it interfere with this star tetrahedron? I was like, well, shit, let's look. Right. And I look and I realized, no, it oh. wouldn't. The way yeah. it sticks out, it's a perfect stellation. So you can actually stellate star tetrahedrons. All You could put eight star tetrahedrons around the octahedron. Yeah. So I didn't know that. No, I know. That's amazing. I love the way that you're going about. This is how I go about my stuff. You know, right. I don't know what I'm doing, but it coming together. But what you just described is the 64 tetrahedron grid. That's, that's exactly what it is. That's, yeah. that's what it builds into is the 64 sided tetrahedron. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So that's the 64. But you see, that's the process of discovery that can happen when you just start exploring geometry. I know this is for the viewers pretty much. Right. <laughs> when you start exploring this, you play with this geometry, you're gonna start finding stuff. You're gonna have to go and research to find out what it is you're making because it's gonna teach you. It's like, it's gonna teach you on your own. 
And right. uh, you just discovered the 64 tetrahedron grid. It probably felt like the first time you might have ever found it and then realized that, wow, right. I've probably seen and, this before. And I've always wondered like how it was built because you know, Nassim Harum, he did a wonderful job unfolding the space and the counter space, but he never explained how the octahedron and the star tetrahedron were connected. Cause I, I've never seen that connection because I'm like, how is a three-sided pyramid connected to a four-sided pyramid that don't, it's like counter counterintuitive kind yeah. of. But well, yeah, I had my, uh, my, my gripes with that too, uh, a little bit because everything is so tetrahedrally focused there that octahedron geometry was kind of like Left it just empty space, like it wasn't shown how it was relating to the whole structure, and that's what really drives the expansion, <laughs> in my mind. Is like you could build the whole thing either out of tetrahedrons or octahedrons, but there was a slight difference when I was working more with octahedron than just with tetrahedrons. Your screen right. flows, so maybe you want to uh, restart. Uh, you're very look very passionate about what it is you're saying, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> do a restart. Let me uh, change the view. How about that? Okay, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Um, oh. Yeah. So the octahedron was key. And I tell you, though, that once you start to potentially work with five octahedron and five cubes, all of a sudden you're going to see the same thing. This is what my next video is going to be about. You could take these same stellations and put them together on this form. And this is operating just like the cube octahedron, really, right. which is part of that octahedral structure that you're talking about. It's just that it's like expanding my perspective to what happens when you introduce it to working with 30 points of the octahedron rather than the six. And then that's really more of a well-rounded sphere. And then that totally introduces the phi ratio. Whether that's important to Kelantics, I'm not sure, but it is a, a form that exists and very much part of the structural geometry. You know, Hey, if it's a form that exists energetically and synergetically, it's important to Kelantics. Oh, okay. uh, because it's really the work is uh overwhelming and intimidating to people because it's so vast and so undeep and so spread out and so mysticized and mythic i don't know it's just there's really nobody doing justice to the work because they either one don't know how what they're doing relates to kelantics or two how kelantics relates to what they're doing or they don't, they don't really care. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people, they just look at shapes and geometry and they, something in their mind hasn't clicked to why this is important. And Keylance is, and why it isn't important because a lot of people don't know the science behind this stuff. They don't know how it works and how it relates to them. And if they can't have an emotional connection, then therefore it doesn't mean anything because you can't care about something you don't have an emotional attachment to yeah. and so me i have an emotional attachment to geometry and to pyramids because i've had experiences with them you know and you have too and that's why we keep doing this work and nobody has to tell us to get up in the morning to go study it nobody has to tell us to draw we just do it and you know because we want to because we love to and i feel like if people understood why we loved it then you know they would be more inclined so Mm -hmm. uh really everything that like i said that me and george just went over so far you can apply to merkaba you can apply to breathing you can apply to your dna you can apply to uh meditation all of this is applicable knowledge it's not just useless information that's just theories no it's actual application it's like a bird without wings uh, uh knowledge without application is like a bird without wings mm -hmm. and so yeah. Yes, I think what you're describing there is it's it really is a transformational experience and it is a lot more than just the structures and the shapes that we're talking about, you know, it it changes you. <laughs> and right. uh, and you have the freedom within that to explore those geometries for yourself, to discover the truth for yourself really because that geometry will draw you towards the truth whatever that's going to be for you. Right. <laughs> so you right. let it work itself, don't take you know, Brit's word or my word or anybody else's word out there because sacred geometry has been given to you like as a tool 
just open the doorway a little bit, start trying it out, and you'll be discovering like Brit the 64 tetrahedron grid or like how the psychosis dodecahedron fits in. It's your own code <laughs> that will awaken for you. Uh, George, and, would you explain it as the geometry expresses itself through you? You don't even have to do nothing. You literally just have to be there with the pen and ruler in your hand. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter. Tell if people understand it doesn't matter how good you can draw your a compass and a ruler. These are predefined perfect structures. You don't have to shade, you don't yeah. have to draw perfect something. Huh. The, anybody at any skill level can pick up a compass and a ruler and create the most perfect designs on the planet, no matter what skill set. Would yeah. you agree? Oh, yeah. That's the that's that's been putting so much of my energy into uh, you know doing the apprenticeships that I've got going. I mean, you know, I'm sharing, I'm teaching people to draw all this, you know, and, and in that you're teaching to see it and then you build the forms and relate and skill level or, you know, how much prior knowledge you have, you go right. from like zero to a hundred in, in, in almost no time. And it's light speed. It's not slow. It's like yeah. he said, like, once you get like some basic knowledge and you just draw the the geometry will draw itself it'll want to come out because your brain wants symmetry it wants harmony it wants e equilibrium it wants peace and geometry isn't just straight lines on a piece of paper they're like planes you know if a if you draw a point and that point on a two-dimensional plane that's actually a pillar right and if you draw a line you're just 3d printing that infinite pillar all the way across so a line from top to bottom is actually a plane yep. of energy so when you're drawing these shapes you're drawing shapes within a grid and so what i want to uh if you want to i can go ahead and get on to explaining some of the chelantic terms yes go and ahead. then relating that to sacred geometry so, yeah. yes yes I, I think uh one last thing to just wrap that little part up is that's what you're describing is activating that mind's eye uh, you know that relationship in the mind's eye to be able to really visualize and see that that line you just did has that dimensionality that is not just a line anymore to you so that's pretty expansive inklings of expansive levels of consciousness to start working with these objects or drawings in this way and really start to experience them as not a flat 2d plane and that's really part of the process and journey and you're speaking from experience and so am I here. So why don't you go ahead and share a little more on that and then maybe we'll flip flop over to my uh, other bit of presentation and we'll see yeah. where we go from oh, there. I wanted to further say that what you were saying with the mind's eye, to be able to experience geometry with that dimensionality, yes. I feel like George, that's where the emotional uh, connection comes from because you can't really, you can only connect so deep with a flat surface you mm -hmm. can experience something in three dimensions you can only touch something in two dimensions you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. so once people realize that this 2d geometry is actually a 3d projection compressed into 2d and that it's actually pyramid information they can actually go and when they draw it they can experience it they can put themselves inside the geometry because it has dimensionality yeah. and shapes or sounds you know, right? Well, you're, you're accessing, you know, a higher mental plane, <laughs> you right. know, plane of manifestation, you know, right. more and more spiritual levels of being, <laughs> you know, whatever you want to put the labels on it, but you'll start to manifest things that no one's ever seen before because you're literally pulling them out of the ether, you know, right. because your mind is expanding awesome. with that way. So you will start to, you know, create these like little pyramid type shapes and you don't know where they're coming from but you're in that seeing so much depth in the 2d that's the 3d that's going into your mental spiritual connection with this relationship that's unfolding you're pulling things directly out of that source right you're a manifester because i mean information literally crystallizes through you like you're crystallizing and mm -hmm. manifesting information into a form and therefore it's tangible it's no longer an idea you know what i'm saying it's no longer a concept like you've crystallized it and there i honestly feel like that's the 
ultimate goal of any artist is to just create. And when you create, you're taking an, something that was a thought or energy form and you're putting it into the physical. And I feel like the highest form of doing that is you broke up a layer a little bit, Britt. You got to you you repeat that one last bit. The highest level of form is where you left off and then you lost the internet. Oh, oh. Um, oh I was just going to say because it's music. You know what I'm saying? Music is ratios mm -hmm. and ratios and harmonics. And so when you're working with these shapes, these are like as if you had a song in your hand. Yes. You know, when you have an octave feature, it's like you have a symphony. Mm -hmm. And so that's really our DNA responds to sound and to light. So mm -hmm. when we work with these shapes. These are like ultimate DNA activators because they're constantly emitting that harmonious frequency because there's a grid, there's an invisible grid, which I'll get into, I'll screen share it here in a second. Mm -hmm. And it's known as the particle grid. So mm -hmm. there's an invisible grid that all of matter and creation manifest on it's like a blueprint of inner a uh, blueprint for energy like spirals when a spiral spirals through the ether or a wave goes through the air it isn't just moving through empty space mm -hmm. it's moving through a grid structure a predefined uh grid a cartesian mathematical grid like how we map out sine waves and all that mm -hmm. well in life would just be that 2D Cartesian grid and just erected into 3D. So therefore you would have this cubic grid. And so sacred geometry are just crystallizations of energy, like pixels on a screen mm -hmm. of the 3D holographic reality. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So Kelantics will explain like what this grid is, how the kelons, which are the crystallizations will manifest through this grid. And how they go about it is through a specific code. And that code is called the crystal spiral sequence or the starborn sequence or the doubling or the octaves. You know, it's just taking something and doubling itself and doubling it numerically, quantumly, geometrically, metaphysically. I mean, it's the whole structure itself is based off this specific angle of incidence. And that's 90 degrees. So when you... Anytime from here on out, you hear the doubling sequence or the crystal spiral in your mind, it should register as a 90 degree angle mm -hmm. because this 90 degree angle is the side view of a crystal spiral. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like this, if you used to map out the crystal spiral, the rate of expansion is 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. The half of that 90 is 45. So the 45 would be the half step or the octave of that harmonic. I mean, of that it would be that harmonic of that octave, excuse me. Mm -hmm. So anytime crystal spiral, anytime you look at geometry, geometry is nothing but a, a, a freeze. Like if you're watching a movie and it's 60 frames per second, right? And so that means it, it's 60 frames per second. Well, let's say life works that way. So a geometry would just be one frame, okay? And then the next frame, would be you know a different geometry or it'd be the same geometry but just rotated a little bit the next frame will be rotated and so as you're rotating frames flat i mean uh still shots of geometry it should rotate so geometry isn't a still structure it's actually poetry in motion you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying so this square is actually a circle it's, that's why they're both 360 degrees mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying so the Geometry should be able to propel a spiral, right? Like all geometrical shapes should be able to fractalize inside themselves, outside themselves, and in all directions. So the only difference between geometries would just be a matter of symmetry. Which one is more symmetrical than the other? That yes. is, that's it. Well, Yes, I know you're going to share your screen here. Maybe we'll touch upon fractality in a bit on right. the slides, and maybe you have more on it. But I do. You know, the, the fractality that is uh, expressed with the uh, phi ratio fractal 
especially, you know, Dan Winter talks a lot about fractality and you see the fractal patterns in nature, et cetera. Some of them are associated with phi ratio. And then you have the fractality of the Sierpinski uh, triangle, you know, the triangles within triangles fractalizing in, in that type of sequence as well. You have these different types of fractaling patterns that are either gonna be, let's just say maybe in golden proportion fractality or division in like a half point, like you were saying, the 45. And there's, yeah, there's, that's this, only there's a slight difference there between the golden ratio fractality, which is going the 1.618 ratio. And well, this is having the golden ratio fractal a 60 degree cone. I, uh, I'm uh, no, the, the one that I showed the, the cone of this uh, structure here, it's 63.4 degrees before that pyramid face. Yes. Uh, Gotcha. I'm making my number slightly off, but it is not exactly 60 degrees. The uh, the cone that fits inside this red triangular structure here, which is the face of the pyramid. We'll save a little bit of that stuff later, uh, but this little face of this triangle here, it's not an equilateral triangle. This is uh, the pyramid, Kepler's version of the pyramid. This is the square root of phi is associated with this. It's close to the Great Pyramid in Giza, very slightly different, but that peak, this, this face itself is uh, 63.4. I'm pretty sure that's the number. It's close, close to that. It's definitely not 60 though. So, um, okay, great. Why don't you share your screen? We got a little bit more on that. And, you know, I have a good amount of time here. This could be a long video. <laughs> I right. guess. So let's uh, let's turn your um, screen like you did horizontally before. So we'll be able yeah, to. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can see it. And just uh, you could probably even zoom out a little bit more. I don't know what's better for you. It's gotten smaller. Yeah. You so you uh, zoom in. I mean. You can keep going. Uh, that's pretty good size. Okay, I'm not sure what you want to show here. So let's see. I don't know. Did I lose your audio or you're still there? The, yes, tap to speak. Maybe I'm, uh, Maybe we did lose your audio. Because I see the slides, but not the hearing you. There you go. You hit off there. Share audio on. Yeah, still, still don't have you yet. Want to restart it? And let's see if we still got you on audio on my... Here? Are you there now? Nope. Yeah, I don't know why it's not. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, I hear you now. That's crazy. I don't know why it wasn't working. It worked the first time you shared the screen. So maybe just uh, give it one more try. All right, let's share the screen. Well, bam. All right. Okay, you're with us now. All right, all right. Okay, so the, what I wanted to go over is the reason why the angle. So the difference, as we said, the difference between the geometries and the spirals are simply the angles. So in Kelantics, what we have is part of chi, part of K, and part of cum. You so want to be seeing that image there? Okay, yeah. Right there. Part yeah. of chi is the top when you, so this will be a triveca, all right? But really what this triveca is representing are three forces of energy. The part of chi being the neutral force, which is a combination of electrical and magnetic. It is the unified force. This, let's just say the, the trinity, the, the spirit. All right. Then the part of cum, which is straight down, uh, this would be the magnetic. All right. Feminine uh, sound force. So this will be a counterclockwise spinning field of energy. All right. And the part of K would be clockwise and this would be the masculine electrical expansive spiral field of energy so uh -huh. the counterclockwise and the clockwise 
both meet in the center and they meet where that vesica uh, Pisces is, and that is the central axis. It's tilted at 45 degrees to show if it was the corner of a cube or mm -hmm. uh, 40, 45 degrees of the Cathar grid. So these phase, okay, these, the part of K and the part of com, the maximum, as far as they can expand away from each other without going into the other quadrant is 90 degrees because mm -hmm. out of 360 degrees, the farthest two things can be away from each other is 45 degrees. And the closest they can be is 45 degrees. So this rate of expansion from zero to 45 to 90, these create the quadrants and the octaves and the, uh, the axis. You know what I'm saying? This, yeah. this is what creates an axis. This is why the geometry is at 45 degree axis because these are at the angles that the part of chi phase. So the part of K, the yellow clockwise and the part of com, they would actually come together into one and they would just be part of chi and the unified uh, part of K and part of com. And that would be a biveca. And then those two would come together into one. And so that's how they would phase. So it would double itself and then they would spark out a way to create this triveca. Does okay. that make sense? Yes, I think the only uh, the only thing there for the viewers is that that wouldn't be a traditional uh, vesica Pisces because that would be if those center points went through each other, that would create the fish bladder shape. And that's all about the seed of life. This is more right. square view. This is on the 90 degree exactly uh, axis here that those circles are so if you went around and did two other circles above and to the left of that you would create you know basically uh fourfold uh, two-fold symmetry fourfold symmetry and be able to create a square there so exactly exactly yeah. and that's what the, this is only this is only one piece of that ruche so when we get into the ruche there would be three other uh portions of these around each other to create that ruche pattern yes. you know what i'm saying and that in itself would create a circulation network mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying of clockwise and counterclockwise and the ratio between so this part of com would be uh 11 and two-thirds so its spirals would be spinning at 11 uh trillion times and two-thirds and the clockwise would be spinning 33 and one thirds. And so together they would create this 45 degree spark and 45 and 45 would create 90, 90 and 90 create 180, 180, 180 create 360. So the 45 degrees is actually has to do with quantum sparks of energy and how they build up to connect into the 360. So it's how the 360 downsteps itself as spark charges. Okay, so that's the reason for the angle. Well, one thing on there though is what 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 is up with the sixty degree angle? Because of course, that's another way to do all the hexagonal geometry that we were showing in the other Ooh. way. I want to. Uh, I have um, not on my current screen. Wait one second. One boom boom. So, whenever these particle units, whenever they phase, one second. So whenever they phase, they go back and forth between uh, 90 degrees and 60 degrees. You know what I'm saying? It's this, uh, whenever they're in the ruche, these two sparks, they're at the 45 degree angle right now, right. but they would actually squeeze together, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Until they were all equilateral to each other, until they were all congruent. You know what I'm saying? Well, then they make 60 degree and you create a hexagon. Yeah, no. So it goes back and forth between 60 and 90. 60 degree is just one angle of the phasing. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So then I just heard a while ago that like 60 or very long time ago that, you know, it was all about the 90 view. And then if it's going back and forth and there's a phasing going on between 90 to 60 and right. then then that other hexagonal perspective, which is what are they? What's the other one that has the twelve circles around? Uh, that is called the eternal the lotus. lotus of yeah. light, right? That's essentially yeah. that because that has four of these shapes. But it then exactly, the exactly. Well, circles. that's well, that's our job, George. Our job is to show how it's connected, and so that's like what I'm coming to conclude is like 
they are connected. You know what I'm saying? And it's just a matter of perspective. And it's a matter of which part of the cycle are we talking about? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And so the 60 degree, the only, what it, what it is, is the 60 degree geometry here. I'll get it. Either your screen shared or you have uh, lost you talking. So I'm not sure. Uh, we don't have anything for you right now. So I hope you can hear me. And I hope I didn't lose you. Uh, hey, Britt, your screen is frozen, I believe. All right, well, uh, let's just see if he catches on. I don't think I can change his, oh, he's back. Maybe I lost Brit altogether. All right, well, hold on folks. Never have had this happen on interview. I believe I'm still on. I could talk about some forms and share my screen, but let me just, uh, and I hope we don't lose you at this point, because if you're really into the Cathar grid, you're not going to want to miss Britt's explanation of this. But I'm going to just send him a Facebook message here and just see if he's going to access the link again. Maybe his phone went dead or something. I'm not sure. And uh, so, as you see, Britt does know quite a bit about the Quilantic science, and I'm pretty thrilled to be on the uh, call with him. I guess as a aside here, let's maybe talk about the pyramid structure that I was describing in regards to uh, the Pentagon shape of that cone shape that is within this. Oh, good, I don't have to keep going. I think he's back on. (laughs) Okay, there we go. I think we're gonna have a very awkward uh, transition there, Britt. I had to kind of make up some stuff and send you an email and a text and everything. (laughs) I was starting to talk about the uh, pyramid stuff, but I didn't really wanna get into that yet. So. Anyway, I'm not sure what happened there for you. And it was the slide that I was actually reading where it specifically explained the 60 degree and the 90 degree. It was on my computer and I was trying to find it because it was just a little excerpt that was perfect. Uh, But yeah, it's okay. Um, Where would you like to? Well, um, did you want to? Share more on the particle and particum and yeah. So I wanted to get into the grid, into the actual grid. I have it uh here on my computer. Are you able to see this? I want to see. Uh, let's see. I can see the computer. Yes, it's going to be small, but that's a little better. Mm-hmm. Are you able to read that? I don't think people are going to, you might have to read most of that for us because I don't believe okay. they'll see it. I, I could share the full screen here. Hold on. Yes, you do it. I'll do full screen for you again and you might be able to see it better. Mm-hmm. Well, I think what I'm going to do is uh, I have my art right here is I might put one of my drawings and I just, I mean, it's just a little short excerpt explaining the morphogenetic grids, the scalar grids, the key lines, you know, uh, but. You know, that material is, uh, unless you're really, really into it, and you've got to really make a commitment to it. No, no, no. Well, it's a a lot to to get through. So, I mean, I'm happy that you're doing it, but I feel like we probably could do a second video where you really go off on that. (laughs) And maybe you want to add more to that now, but do what you want to add now to help viewers who are dabbling into that, to help them break through if they're on the fence of checking it out. Right, right. Well, really, the only thing I wanted to cover was the actual grid, because I wanted to establish that there's an invisible grid 
you know what I'm saying? And then there's the geometries mm -hmm. and that the geometry, depending on that geometry, doesn't actually fully represent the grid itself. You know what I'm saying? It may just be an isolated geometry. Well, some geometries actually represent the grid and mm -hmm. the Cathar grid would be the scalar grid that the other's geometries manifest through. You know what I'm saying? So I was going to get in like, there's the geometry either tunes in or represents the grid or it's a crystallization, a manifestation within that grid, mm -hmm. depending upon perspective. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I was going to. Do you think, that was the only uh, thing I was think any of my other images in the other slideshow I have show that when I, you know, made the models of the Cathar grid and all that? You yeah, know, I think there was one where you had the double Cathar grid. You want me to show that one real quick? So yeah, uh, maybe yeah. we'll do that um, because I think my images on my screen are going to be a little bit larger and uh, people will be yeah, able to see them. Idea. That's really all I want is as long as it's high definition and people can, you know, take screenshots and zoom in and stuff. That's really what I want. Let me uh, open this one here. And... <clears throat> Where's that presentation? Okay, this is the one that should be uh, up now. And I just wanna share a few things on this material, but we're not gonna do it now. We're gonna continue with the crystal spiral components. And we were talking about the Cathar grid basic structure units. Uh, yeah. You know, this is the 3D model that I came up with at the time. I didn't really know if it was gonna have any meaning, but it is built on the octahedral symmetry that uh, it's a portion of it because we have the cube right. and this is a portion of that rhombic dodecahedron. I put them together. Here's the octahedron and the cube compound, right? That right. Rick was talking about. So that's- So what would you call that 3D structure? What Which would you one? call that full 3D? Because it's a cube and on each face of the cube, there's a pyramid, right? Yes, that, well, that is the, uh, it's a compound of the cube and the octahedron. That's what it's called, the compound, okay. because- the cube edges are intersecting the octahedron edges, right. so they're in compound. And when you connect the dots, you make those diamond uh, rhombic faces like so. And then you get the this rhombic 12-sided uh, dodecahedron. But, uh, you know, that was just a portion of it because, you know, when you took just the Cathara units like this and you start to plug them in together from a flat view, it just looks like a cross, right? A crisscross, but this is actually coming towards you, you in a way. Right, right. This has the diagonals on it. On the Cathar grid, my problem, my main problem with all the Cathars out is they don't have the diagonal, so it doesn't even have the root two ratio because it don't like this those Cathar grids. The, they're yes. miss no the drawing ones, the flat ones. Right. Those don't have the diagonals. That's what it's missing. No, no, no. Mine right here. They got that. Yeah. No, no, no. Your, yours do. When I, that you see that Cathar grid on the right. Yes. No, go back. Oh. Um, yeah. Those white ones. Yeah. All they need is the uh, diagonals in it from corner. These. You know, from the corner of the cube, kind of like how you did your 3D. That's what mm -hmm. they're missing. Oh, okay. Yes, because that's right. I I uh, I followed the pictures basically on exactly. the and the build when you build it within hand. <laughs> this is what you come up with. I have exactly. to actually, uh, you know, I put string in this to show this, and that does create another form. You know, if you do that right. with string, it will create stuff, but uh, it doesn't include the. Well, actually, uh, this is root three. This is actually right, um, root three going through the cube from, you know, corner to corner of the uh, vertice to vertice through the internal right. diagonal, right? Two. Root two would just be across the face. So they right. both in the square orientation, they share the same line. So you don't know if you're looking at root three or root two, but uh, when they're yellow like that, it means it's root three. So each of these have a right. central vertice, basically each of these cubes have a central vertice. Exactly. And that's honestly what Kelantix and Cathara is missing is the diagonals. Like, cause when you only, the, the diagonals that they have are only the root three tilted plane equilateral triangles. So really it needs its diagonal to enter that scalar view, that full eight X, which you did on your 3D is you have those diagonals mm -hmm. and those diagonals connect from corner to corner. Right. You know what I'm saying? And that introduces that root two ratio into there. Yes. And remember, this is now is really part of a smaller, a bigger structure. 
It's right, like, exactly. like the heart of a bigger structure that when you fill out the rest of this, you essentially replicate another larger one of these. It, it, mm -hmm. And this is what you just keep coming back to. It's like, that is just the internal structure. In fact, you could see right in here, that is, this is that form right, right exactly. here. It's right, yep. it's right in there. Mm -hmm. So yep. it's like and those it lines good. all add up to being this diamond shaped rhombic structure. And you could right. build that off of each one of these cubes because wherever there's a cube, you put another octahedron right. and then you're just exactly. essentially building a you bigger. You could even make another one of those crosses like how you made it and shift it 90 degrees. So there's one coming out that way and one coming out that way. So you have this 3D cross structure. Well, that is, that is coming towards you and away. Uh, because look, oh, this is what happens when, when you rotate it, right? So if I orient that whole structure, let me move this out of the way. Now I've rotated, this is like a jack, basically, you know, ah, jack. Yeah. So now this is coming angled. Uh, these three are coming up and out, you know, and these, these other three are going down. These lower ones are going down. I'm glad you moved the flower blank because now I, I can see that. Dang, that's so beautiful. Yeah, so that's like that same, that. this really, this is the mind blowing stuff when you start to build this, like you build this, all of a sudden, these three points, one, and two, watch three, this slide. right? Just picture yeah. this, one, two, three, those three points, those three mm -hmm. points are going to be one, two, three. <laughs> the no. other three are on the back, and that's what that yeah, is. They just, it compacts it because since you tilt it, they shrink in 3D space, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, the arms aren't radiating out because that, right. you know looks like the cross but all of a sudden you do this and your orientation completely changes but this is the same form it's on the same floor same day same picture no fudge messing with the thing and and i'm just really trying to illustrate is this creates you see the hexagon shapes yeah yeah of course exactly Perfect. you've so, got a seed of life this is the, you've got a circle in the middle if i put a circle mm -hmm. here Circle here, going through the center. Circle there, circle there, circle there. Six circles, one circle. That's what I'm trying to show here, really, is essentially those are the circles. It's warped because you know you're dealing with the 3D, but you see how they line up, right? A hundred percent. That's perfect, man. That's perfect. But uh, so this is the thing you got to describe to me. Is it a three-dimensional geometry that we're working with with Cathar? Is it just meant to be like a flat 2D map? You know, is it supposed to represent universal, you know, no. internal structure? Or is it really about the consciousness, uh, like a like a kind of, uh, not even a map of the terrain, more like a, like like a picture <laughs> that you put letters on to describe stuff. Right. So this is the the defining factor of like the usage and the point and what it's describing is how energy works. The map upon which energy moves through the angles at which energy is interfacing at like wave conjugation. Like when Phi talks about wave conjugation, those are the angles of which the, the spirals meet, you know what I'm saying? So wave conjugation, uh, the template upon which matter manifests, uh, the programs that are running through our body, it's, it's, it's instruction manuals. So everything that you're looking at is a language. So we look at geometry, we can sit here and talk hours and hours and hours because we understand the language. Mm -hmm. we, we know how to read geometry. Other people, if they haven't understood, they haven't connected with the geometry, they're just gonna look at it and be like, oh, it's pretty. So they haven't activated that language receptor. So whenever you understand the language, it's programming your DNA. So anytime you look at, you know, shapes and stuff, it's information being sent to your DNA, being sent to your biofields, being sent to your heart and all that. So if you look at this, this flower of life circular arrangement, uh, I'm going to zoom in. The diagonals, you see the di See, you have the vertical, yeah. you have the vertical axis, right? So we're mm -hmm. going to talk about axis strictly, all right? Mm -hmm. Where's the horizontal axis? Right here. Right. But there's no line that's actually really kind of defining the horizontal. But we see it's there because the we could draw a line and it's perfect. Good. So it has it, but it's not defined. Mm -hmm. So take as that as information uh, missing, right? Mm -hmm. Just simply as that. And then let's get to the diagonals. 
So you have two diagonals coming in at 60 degrees, right? Those are 60 degree diagonals. Well, those diagonals do not represent the scalar wave diagonals, Uh okay? Because the scalar wave diagonals come at 45 degrees. So those are the same diagonals as the 45 degree, but they're tilted. And you heard this term before thrown around, it's called phase locked, right? All the diagonals are phase locked. Mm -hmm. Well, in Quilantic's energy is sparking and they're coming together. It's breathing. So the Mm -hmm. structure is breathing. The diagonals are coming from horizontal and they're breathing up to the vertical. They're coming back down. And so your template, your Merkaba field is breathing in the same manner. Mm -hmm. So these diagonals in this specific view, they're stuck. All right. In Quilantics, we explain that it's static. When something is static and it's stuck and it's unable to phase, it's unable to move, it becomes phase locked. And when it becomes phase locked, it's not able to breathe. When the energy structure is not able to breathe, it's not able to regenerate itself. When it's not able to regenerate itself, it becomes finite. Mm -hmm. So it's the metaphysics of energy via the, the angle of the diagonals. So there's nothing wrong with this shape. There's just <clears throat> something wrong with working with this shape exclusively. Only this shape, only the diagonal stuck at that angle. As I shown you, you remember I sent you that picture? Yeah. Where it showed the Merkaba inside the guitar grid. Mm-hmm. You know, they fit inside of each other, but there's, there's a grid, right? So when you look at a, a holographic grid, you're always gonna have a vertical axis you're going to have a horizontal axis and you're going to have your diagonals because they're equally spaced, right? 45 degrees from each other. That's the maximum. You can't take the horizontal axis and move them any degree because it would go into the other quadrant, right? It wouldn't be fully symmetrical. Uh Uh, Yes. Yes. I just, I want to just see when you're saying the Merkaba field, right? Your Merkaba that you have, when you're looking, if that's a tetrahedron Merkaba, I'm assuming this is what you're talking about when you're saying the Merkaba. Right? I believe it's both. I believe we have the octahedral Merkaba and the tetrahedral Merkaba. Okay. okay, so they're both, you're calling them both Merkabas, both bodies. Right, both okay, Merkabas. all right. Because right. that's just, we, you know, because really, I guess what you're saying here is like, if this is a Mer- Merkaba, the way most people usually describe it is the, the star tetrahedron right. like so, right? Mm-hmm. Then what we're really doing if this is a, this is a let's say this is your your view or someone's view of how they like to right. visualize the energy body your heads up here your feet are down here you know this is your star tetrahedron merkaba very right. common right. all over sacred geometry then what you're really doing and looking at this though and this is how i don't see how it relates to the energetics of the body like I do hear how you're saying, like, if we just focus on one view, then we are definitely phase locked. <laughs> and everything about my work is to show all these other views to get out of phase lock, basically. <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. So, but but this this view, if your star tetrahedron is like you're looking at it like this, you're, you're just looking at it like this. This is just the vertex. Exactly. field. So that's just the equilateral triangles. Wow. So. But that most people don't even realize that they think that this is your Merkaba and it's going like this, like that. Right. That's this point isn't the vertex. It's like right. you know, they don't yeah. realize that that's your, if you're this is your head up here if you want to look at it that way, right? Because right. they think it's going around like this, so it gets really confusing what's out there. And hundred percent. So this is just to you know if you're looking at it as a cube and you're in a vertex view and you're in a tetrahedron star Merkaba. Your orientation here, this is the vertex here. If it's the octahedron, then your vertex is over here. And if you think you're in an octahedron, you're angled over here like this, and you're now spinning exactly. like this. Exactly. This. Exactly. So, so you, and this is really what I'll say yeah. is like the grid, the energy grid that life moves through doesn't move. The geometry is the planes that make up life. Like when I move my hand, that empty space becomes my hand it's like the pixels on a screen like it looks like it's moving it's the illusion of movement but it's 
the perturbation of that area that becomes that substance when you move through it. So the Star of David really isn't spinning. It's the spirals inside the cone that are spinning. So the reason why I believe that the octahed octahedron is the full spectrum Merkaba is because the base of a tetrahedron is 180 degrees. So if we're getting into spirals and the star tetrahedron is a three-sided pyramid, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, right, no, is a three-sided pyramid. Do you have a? Can you show that star tetrahedron again? Yeah. So I have all six points on here, or eight. But if I look at it like this, then you have three of them coming up, right? Exactly. Okay. So as you see, this is a spiral, right? Mm -hmm. You fit that spiral on there. There's this triangle equals spirals of energy. Mm -hmm. right? And if the base of it is only 180 degrees, well, that means that the charge, the quantum charge of that spiral is only 180 degrees. Well, and then when you so you're saying 360 another, with the square. Well, well, no, well, well, the bottom of an equilateral, the bottom of a tetrahedron is 180 yeah. degrees. Exactly. Yeah. And then when you put another star tetrahedron to it, then mm -hmm. it equals 360, right? Yes, but they're, they're got a space between them. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. So what I'm saying is the chart, one spiral, you know what I'm saying? The charge of it would only be 180 degrees per tetrahedra. Mm -hmm. But it, on an octahedra, the charge of that spiral would be 360 degrees. So right. each spiral would actually have double the amount of charge. Because really that's, you know, how Buddy James gets in to talk about the, you know, the quantum, the Theodorian roots and all that. Yeah. Well, quilontic science is explaining the same thing that geometry is the form that spirals move through. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And if you compact the form, you compact the angle of expansion rate of the spiral, and therefore you limit the amount of energy that's being drawn into that structure. Yes. That's really good. Well, that maybe that, yeah. So, I mean, I just put this image up because uh, I don't know if it helps, but. Uh, you know, if you're if you're looking at the heart of the Cathara grid, like one unit of it, that would be oriented with right. an octahedron. And, you know, this portion is this little uh, is this thing right here, right? This black right. structure is this unit. That's your that's the square. This is an octahedron. If we put this all the way out, you know, there's an octahedron right. in here. The, this is this unit is really just a subset of something larger. That's the way I see it. But if I go to this little spirals in the body, then that yellow structure here is that unit. And that is octahedron here and here. And the cube itself would be, uh, here's the blue. There's the octahedron. You see the blue right. structure? Yep, that's it. There's the cube octahedron, the cube. So that in this view, what I came to is after looking at the chelontics and putting on my octahedron thinking cap <laughs> right. and feeling the spirals in myself, that made the most sense, really. It, it made right. sense to have it oriented this way. Uh, of course. So this, is, uh, so this is what I was getting at. So um, the grid, right? There's a grid that the geometries are found inside of. And so if we can, you can see my camera, right? So if I switch my camera around, would you, do you see that? Uh, I see you still, so. Oh, what? Well, do I need no to good. go to full screen here? Maybe, yeah. that will be small. Let me stop my share and we can see what you've got. Well, bam, can you see that? Yes, I'm zooming in on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is, this is the Cathar grid, right? Yeah. I, I drew an incomplete grid around all these shapes for a reason. Okay. It's incomplete. It doesn't go all the way through here. It doesn't go all the way through here. Yeah. So as you see, this is a, I drew this as a 3d shape, right? Mm -hmm. So this is one wall. This is the front wall. Orange is the back wall. Green is that back wall. So blue is this front. Red is this front. So you have this four sided uh, thing, right? So these diagonals, as you see these diagonals, this is actually a 3D structure. So usually when we look at something 3D, mm -hmm. we look at it from a hexagonal. Well, this is a hexagon. This is a two to one hexagon. One, two, three, four, five, six. This has six sides. Mm -hmm. 
So this would be the front, front left view going through the back of it. You know what I'm saying? And this would be the back right. You know what I'm saying? This would be the front right going through the structure, yeah. through the back right. And this is the vertical axis and this is the horizontal. So usually, like I said, when we see 3D geometries, this diagonal is usually squinched down into 60 degrees. And we're used to looking at it from a one-to-one -one hexagon view. What yeah. I'm trying to propose to people is that this eight axis 45 degree actually is a same three-dimensional template that we can draw our 3d geos on with the diagonals put in the proper place you know what i'm saying they're at the 45 degree 90 mm -hmm. does that make sense so I, this is i think so i think what you like if i look at that central square shape and i you're making it not sound like it's just a square anymore. You've turned it into no. another type of form. And I think you have to build that and see if that works out because you're describing those planes as like a, a different type of unique shape that is a little different than what I was sharing just a uh, moment right. ago. Well, yeah, that's what I was trying to show you. So you see these diamonds right here, George? Yeah. Well, these diamonds, we'll look at them as platforms, as right. like a level plane, mm -hmm. one plane, two plane, three planes. And so there's three levels to this Cathara, right? But it's just yeah. tilted. It's just tilted yeah. a little bit. So, okay, that changes things a lot because you're right. basically describing a, like a, a rectangular type of shape in the center of that. Exactly. That pyramid exactly. on top. It's it expands into a rectangular position when you tilt it. Mm -hmm. you see? So what so, you need to do is you, you have to reorient that to a square view to see what the height of that rectangular shape is and then see what the height of those pyramids are once you reorient that back to flat because you, you, you've- well, What I'm gonna show you is both of those views are already encoded in here. And this is how I'll prove it to you. You see this square, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, this square is going through the center of this platform. So mm -hmm. if this is a flat tilted platform, this is the top, right? This is a pyramid. Yes. Right. This yeah. is the base platform. This is a pyramid and this is the bottom base. So this square, it has its square view encoded in here, right? Mm -hmm. If you was to tilt it, that's what are, all these lines come yeah. from is yeah. they are the corners of the face of each wall. So depending upon which wall is depending upon mm -hmm. where this X are coming from. So it has all the tilts yeah. in this one view. Yeah, I, I think I know what you're saying. It sounds like your uh, your your length, your your upper, let's say, width of the square that's going across right. the pyramid is, uh, you're saying that that's basically root two going across that, square and that if you right. rotated along those axes you would reorient back to your square so that would actually be your height and root exactly. two across that so the edge then would be you just be an edge view then this so, be so this right here so let's say this red view right this angle we're going to take uh from this corner trace it from that corner mm -hmm. and then from here trace it through here so the corner i mean the center of that wall would be right here mm -hmm. well if you want to go from side view you know each of these x's are nothing but the face of a wall you know what i'm saying so if we look on the back template you know what i'm saying it looks like a lot but i took progressions like here <laughs> you know what i'm saying you could tilt it it expands usually when you tilt something in 3D space, it shrinks. Yeah. But the Cathara, it goes from square view, it actually shrinks into a rectangular view and expands its length somehow in this view, even though it's 2D. You know what I'm saying? Yes, I get it. I think I think because uh, I think you you gotta continue to see what happens with that for you and kind right. of you know, just work with building it, rotate the structure, see how it orients from the different views and things like that. So then you, you know, you, you might be onto a different way than I was just proposing looking at it, but that then is going to be different in how all those forms, like if you put a bunch of those together, 
<laughs> then right. they're not going to just meet up all happy go lucky like because that's right. one everything has to follow that tilt so like your your model that you draw on just above that uh just slide your paper down this one up here then in that view all those in your description would also have that oriented tilt right right so this is actually where i think that rectangle comes from is uh this right here george i want to show you mm -hmm. So I was cutting out cubes, right? I was cutting out wooden cubes because yeah. I wanted to make some pyramids, right? So I cut these out. So these are all one-to-one -one faces. And then I was gonna cut them in half so I can make two pyramids per cube. But when I got to the base, I was like, well, what the fuck, man? Like, why is this base rectangular? You know what I'm saying? If this is root two, you know what I'm saying? If this is one and this is 1.418, then that means that in each vertex of the cube, there are rectangles. So the rectangle is actually encoded inside the cube from corner, you know what I'm saying, from corner to corner. So when we draw, uh, say this flat triangle, we draw a line, that line is actually a rectangular plane. And yeah. I feel like this rectangular plane is actually the same thing as the planes in the cube. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I've seen something you, like um, that talks about how many different rectangular planes are in the cube. Um, an image yeah. that describes that somewhere along. Yeah, Walter research. Russell. Yes. Yeah. So that's um, you know that's where that's that's the the trail you're following. You know when you talked about you know light not being kind of in a steady state you know cubic version of that, and you're moving through right. that. You know, I mean that's how he describes. Uh, right. the nature of so, uh, reality like maybe the golden the golden rectangle or the fibonacci are actually spirals programming on that rectangular plane and the cathara grid are spirals programmed on that face cubic plane yes well now i have another cube that is uh it, it, you know to get the golden spiral to be that rectangle you have to have a truncated version of the cube you know, which right, right. I can show, I could draw, like the geometry showed me how to draw that very simply. And, right. you know, then all of a sudden I have golden rectangles going through, but all of a sudden we're dealing with a kind of new unit that is cubic, but it's, uh, you know, transformed, kind transformed of. by the golden ratio. So let's, uh, let's transition to my slides and kind of get close to wrapping up. But, you know, I wanted to share the stuff on Metatron because I know Metatron's cube yes. is discussed in there. So let's do a little of that. I think I'll like, save all the experimental pyramid stuff for uh, maybe another time. So, you know, we like, like he's like Britt was saying, you know, I hope viewers are still listening and this has been exciting because uh, he and I probably can go, like a week long workshop easily <laughs> on all the material the time, that we've man. dug into this. Um, so I, yes, you know, Metatron's cube, my videos, I have at least three videos out there. I think I'll probably maybe one of the only people who really directly describe some of the, uh, you, you're seeing the, the you uh, yeah, probably really just really addresses this like flat out straight. And I'm gonna do another one soon because the most common complaint I hear that people who want to hold on to this view of the dodecahedron says, well, maybe it's a perspective drawing, uh, you know, that you're looking at it from a perspective view. But right. really, when you're dealing with geometry, you are locked in. These two phi base forms here will not be uh, re reproducible with phi proportion, which means right. you're really missing out on like a whole like expansion in geometry, like probably never seen before for the average. No, I've seen, yeah, I've seen your slides on that. And that really is much more expansive with that new flower of life method. Exactly. Yeah, but you see, I apply these golden circles. This is what I call this, the golden circle seed of life, because it is the seed of life. And I'm exploring this through the hexagonal perspective. I have no fear of that. <laughs> you know, I love it. And, hmm, and all of a great. sudden, I'm producing, you know, the Kepler points so polyhedra accurately. I'm doing Dan Winter's expansion models through this view and all the other ones. And, right. you know, doing the Icasa dodeca right, you know, uh, and uh, 30 other forms, really, and more and more discovered all the time. And 4D forms, stuff like that. With this view, wow. it's just good for viewers to know as associated to crystal spiral. I don't have anything against Metatron or any of that. I'm not into that side of this, but 
like this diagram will not produce these forms accurately. The phi based ones, you get cube, tetrahedron, octahedron from this perspective. And that's essentially what I wanted to share on that just so viewers can see that uh, in this video, at least, that Metatron's cube is, uh, you know, is not, is not accurately producing all the forms of creation like it is proposed and said to and do. I think that's honestly like what the core of Kelantic's Kelantic science was trying to explain, but they didn't, they didn't really go about updating the template like you did. Like you updated the template and then showed how that template is superior, like far superior than the Metatron's cube. And not just because you said so, or just because it feels right. No, because you can actually measure and map out these crystallizations accurately and prove it. When is the other one you've done proved that they don't produce that? It isn't really an opinion thing. It's a fact. Exactly. You know? It really is pretty much a fact. It is a fact. And, you know, I think that that's one thing that is important maybe for the Kilantic folks who, you know, the daisy of death is a commonly been used in the past there. And I address it in my other videos. I didn't go there because then that would have me just not really address this issue. <laughs> you know, right. well, I, this is a big issue because this geometry is really out there. There's well-known geometers, there's a gazillion books on sacred geometry. It's like, it's not going away anytime quick. So right. it was really like, let's see what happens here. And this took a lot of work to kind of figure out how to go about this so fix of solution, which is very simple, add phi ratio circles, and that's it. So if you're into the platonic solids and you're into that, then like I'm clearly showing you how the pentagons that should be accurate, it, like these are one for one. If you scroll up, they fit this orientation where these are distorted. This whole video is Metatron's cube distorts phi ratio forms. That's the name of the video. I don't need to say much more about it, but it's good to know because I feel like it is part of this upgrade to our next uh, sacred geometry uh, evolution, let's just say, of, you know, keep pushing the field forward, really. A hundred percent. I totally a hundred million percent agree with that because what, what, what the problem is, George, is people have just been taking people's word for it. Like these top minds in academia and geometry and science, like they're intelligent and we just take their word for it. But actually when we get down to the nitty gritty, and we cross reference and overlay and measure, we find out that most of it's bull crap, or at least it's not how they say it is. And then we find out it's actually a different way. And there's actually a much more expansive, there's a much more activating, there's a much more stimulating way to go about it than the way that they've been telling us. Exactly. Know? And that's why I think it's very important to share exactly the tools of the geometer so that everybody can do it. I have geometers, like just even part of New Geometers Facebook group who are drawing this stuff, not even ever taking any classes with me because I put it out there really openly. You could just right. watch a video and start to do this stuff and test it out for yourself. Like you got to right. discover the truth of these things for yourself. I mean, I, I sent this to a well-known geometer when I discovered that you know, the pyramid angle was not 51, 51 degrees, uh, you know, it's 51.8273, but 51, 51 was everywhere out there. And I actually double checked the measurements, put them in, figured out the degrees per minutes and everything. Right. I was like, wow, all I had to do is just put this into a triangle calculator <laughs> that tells me the correct angle. But what happens is you read it in a book, so-and-so says it, that's the word, <laughs> then it gets passed and it on and on and on. And then... I, if I don't know anything about how to enter in numbers in the tri triangle calculator just to see the angle and how to interpret that, then I just don't have the ability to interact with this material. And like right. even people in Kelantics who are integrated, do the, teach them to draw it, you know, work with the form so they really get to know it and make their own discoveries because there's something, a little seed in sacred geometry for everybody that's waiting to get a little water. <laughs> right. Once it gets a little water, it's going to sprout. And you have your own scripted code, let's just say, that just starts to uh, blossom and flourish. And it will right. move you on your journey. Out. Right. Yeah. Your own codex, your own expression, your own language, your own thumbprint of who you are just will pour out of you if you let it. And mm -hmm. if you have a foundation. 
And so you with these videos, you're enabling people to have a clear foundation of what it is, how to work with it, how to draw, and then just water it. And once the water, it'll frack because like a plant is fractal. A plant is a repeating pattern, a recursive pattern. And just like that, these codes will pour out of you if, if you tap into the right fractal code and understand that that's what it is, you know? So I feel like that's all a matter it is, is just a comparison of angle perspectives and comparison of uh, fractal programs. Mm -hmm. And really, if you really get down to it, that's really all it is. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, that's why if people are interested, um, I know it says Rush God Seed, but this is part of a video. If you want to draw the crystal spiral, right, after all I'll talk, I give a nice right. tutorial that walks through drawing the circles and you can do it. It's under the crystal spiral section where this video is going to go into. So just check it out in there. And then, you know, it, this is just one little segment of it, but it shows you how to draw from the scratch, the squares right. and squares and squares, where to put the compass to start to do the little arcs. And I know this is, you know, supposed to be a smooth arc. It's not supposed to be one for one, but when you're doing sacred geometry, you are creating a smooth arc through little segments of right. circles and that's where mm -hmm. all the i talk about phi ratio and how it's related to the circles and talk about the math and the root two and the different other measurements that are associated with this which are all part of sacred geometry and sacred right. geometry is connected to the numbers and the forms so you know it's quite an educational process and i didn't know any of this stuff <laughs> i'm not no math person <laughs> i'm not a right, math but person. when you when you when you are curious and you're open, you can become an expert in your own field in no time. It doesn't take seven, eight, 10 years to yeah, become an addict. Yes, that's exactly true. Uh, just a few more slides and I'll end on one of yours, which I think you'll like. Um, this one is the uh, Roosh God Seed. Once again, I just show how I rotated this with the model. Britt's on some other discoveries around this, but I'm looking forward to see what he comes up with that angled version he was showing us. But this is what I discovered at the time. If I just mm -hmm. rotate that form, connecting all the dots layout this way, just pause the screen if you want to really study and look at that. It's a seed of life from a different perspective, although these circles are different. Right. They're not the same circles. That's an important point. Exactly. Um, same, same, isn't that crazy? The same grid structure can produce different circles, different size circles. Well, you know, I think really, Britt, that just comes down to the techniques you need to use with sacred geometry to produce the points. You know, it's right. like, I need to use these circles to get these points so I could place them. If I, and if I switch to that orientation, I need to use different size circles. I can't use the True. same size circle. They just don't transpose the right. form one-to-one. -one. And that's how and, I relate. Would, would you think that that is why perspective is key? Because since you shifted the perspective of the grid, you had to change ratio of circles in order to connect those lines, right? True, but you see, I'll, I could find those ratios still in True. those circles. They're just gonna be at a different scale. But if I start the right. scale, you know, if, if we always use our measurement at one inch, then we're locked. And then if we rotate to the new scale, then that will change. But if we just have a bit more scale and variance, we could find those same ratios because any size square, Right. 1,000 or 1 million, this is going to be a root two related measurement. 100%. Right. So, 100%. so that's, that's the practical nature of it. Yes. Yeah. Right. And uh, this one you did, and I did it real quick before we got on, and I, you, you seemed excited about, so do you want to share a little bit on uh, just what you were up to on this one? Yeah, so actually, so how I started this drawing off is you, I started my compass, my inner six petals, I'm gonna zoom in. So I had my inner six pedal. Well, how, actually I drew one pedal. And cause I usually go into the four, I usually go into the four sphere mode where I find the diagonals, yeah. right? And, but for some reason I didn't do that. I yeah. went from that one pedal and I kept the same length and I just took my compass and I went to the side and it made another pedal. And then I kept going and then it wound up making six. And so that was actually the first time I've ever drew out six petals, the inner six petals. Yeah. And I was like, oh crap. So I got a hexagon. Yep. So I was like, well, how does the Star of David fit inside the Cathar grid? Because I just, yeah. just want to know how it fit. And what I realized 
is that whenever I drew those six inner petals, you know, yeah. that whenever I drew a line in between it, it created the the vertical line. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Because where those, uh, yeah, so where the petals, you know, I drew a triangle. What I did, my bad. I drew a triangle connecting the tips of the petals. So I drew yeah. a triangle yeah. around three petals and then I drew yeah. a triangle around the other three. Yeah. And then I realized that where they connected, you know, I created that horizontal line. Exactly. Right? And then when I went from the horizontal line in the very center, yeah yeah that horizontal line then i i drew my square so mm -hmm. I, I went from the horizontal line and found the square mm -hmm. uh, yeah no i thought I it was awesome point. yeah i really because i drew that really fast because you know i'll check everything <laughs> i don't you know and, and i'm not afraid That's to good. hurt anybody <laughs> i'm not afraid to hurt anybody's feelings if they send me a draw something to say check this out and you know right. because i wanted to make sure that like this edge here of this square really intersected this section of the hexagon because I've never done this myself. I mean, maybe I did, didn't realize it, but really right. highlighted as well because this is one of those Cathar grid units right here. Mm -hmm. And he's showing yeah. that it's intersecting the uh, Star of David. And this is overlapping right here. They cross each other at that point to go through. And uh, I thought that was just really beautiful the way that that connected right. from the six to the four. And, and as we were describing before, this is one, two, three, four circles. So that was the Qatar. Mm -hmm. You could do the Qatar just on that by itself, but the hexagon is added and this is part of that eternal lotus. All you have to do is add right. four more circles and you have 12 petals. So it's connected to seed of life geometry. We just have 12 circles rather than six there. Exactly, okay. exactly. So you see that the diagonal of the Qatar grid don't line up with the tips of the hexagon right so it don't the tips of the hexagon aren't the axis mm -hmm. you see so you see the blue tip right there and the blue tip right uh, usually people yeah. right there yeah right go up to the top left right top here. left tip of the, no other side. On, i'm getting i'm getting a little lost start over the the triangular tip just go right here right there right yeah well symmetrically on the other side right yeah you would have right people would usually think that that is the diagonal axis right mm -hmm. because they would draw a line connecting the petals you know uh from tip to tip yeah right this way 60 degrees D oh this way yeah right right so people would usually think that that is the diagonal axis Right, yeah. because it's all uh, as the tip, and so they were they would draw the grid structure according to that phase lock diagonal axis. But as you see, the diagonal is still at forty five degrees. No matter if there's a hexagon inside of it or not, the diagonal axis doesn't move mm -hmm. into forty five degrees. You see what I'm saying? So if you was to shift this drawing until the tip of the the Merkaba is central you know what i'm saying you would see sideways you know what i'm saying yes well the Merkaba here is ver or vertex is oriented towards us right now right it's right in right the center so well, sam the tips if you was to just shift this Merkaba yeah. until we align to the other cone to the other tip right next to it this one here? No, the right above it. This that little one? one. No, uh, in between that. The Merkaba tip. Right Star yeah. David tip. Well, there's one, two, three. Those, those, those two. Yeah, that one right there. One that here. one. Oh, okay. Yeah. If we were to just shift the drawing, you know what I'm saying, sideways yeah. until that was the, the center, you know what I'm saying, you would have a horizontal axis. That, that diagonal would become horizontal. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Well, it's just a double star, David, basically. You're just doing, it sounds like you're just doing 12 pointed star, right? Because you have a six pointed star, you would just do a 12 pointed star in there. Is that what you're describing? Like if you just rotated this, or spun it basically, it would just end up here and here. Like this the angle here would be here. The, exactly. The, yeah. That's what I'm saying is they morph. So in the Qatar grid, it rotates every 45 degrees. And so mm -hmm. when you rotate something, it scales up in size. It either expands at root two or it contracts. So rotation leads to scaling. Mm -hmm. So if you were to turn this drawing 
that star David would just be one to one. It -hmm. would just stay the same size. And that's so it wouldn't scale up the Cathara grid. If you were to turn a Cathara grid 45 degrees, it would have a smaller Cathara grid embedded inside of itself, scaled down at root two. That's really the only difference Mm -hmm. is the rotation and the scaling. Yes, the Cathara grid unit, though, is now uh, the vertices are, you know, it's like this. Your Star of David vertices are like this. The Cathara unit's like this. But yes. Remember, yes, though, that this square could be built vertically as well. In fact, right. you, exactly. yes, what you're showing here is that it looks like you could have an octahedral structure because you added the square to right. this. You have octahedral structure, so you do have the vertice of both. And I've drawn something like this a little while back where they do share the central vertice. What you're showing really is the possibility that the octahedron and the star tetrahedron are sharing the uh, same vertice like this. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. I gotta show you some other drawings on that because I have one like that and I have a drawing technique similar to this, a little bit different, that actually aligns the Merkaba rather than having the vertices here, we can also have the vertices here because remember the octahedron, you're looking at it like, like this. So right. either this could be the vertice or you could have it this way, but now we'll rotate the Merkaba this way so we can actually look at it from the side and exactly. have this from the side view. And that makes more sense visually um, right. because of just the, it's hard picturing the octahedron vertice over here. Exactly. And you could put a person in that and see it's it visually a lot better. Right, right. Yeah, that's a part two, and we'll talk about that on the sidelines, I think. And I honestly think you're onto something more here because when you sent me this, I just want to, I want to just add this because I did a little work on it today. Right, it's right. Just I'm adding a lot of things here, and you know, they're showing how the the star of David here is connected to the Cathar grid. So I was like, hey, I'll draw this out real quick, and and all of a sudden, your your star of David is totally distorted. It's not. It lines right. up in here. Look at the small the triangle is. It doesn't match up. But that's if you try to connect it this way and have it fit all nicely in there. If I actually do the Star of David with the same size, none of that all actually touches. So, you know, there's a right. lot going on here. This probably has a lot of meaning to other people. But when I just looked at it structurally for the geometry, I had difficulties with it. And right. it doesn't put the rest of the stuff in question. But I would say... Start checking this out. <laughs> Wait, this can you go back shows... to that other diagram yeah. that you were just at? This is what I wanted to point out. So the top left diagram. Yeah. So that is a, a diagram of, it shows the different dimensional levels and it shows the spheres. These are, these are cathara grids within cathara grids. So this one is probably the D3 mental body. There's the D4 emotional body, bigger outside of that, D5, bigger. D6 and they nest and they fractalize inside of each other, but they fractalize and they're all connected on the diagonal. As you see that Merkaba, the tips of the Merkaba, they aren't connected from tip to tip to create an axis because that's not what the energy field is showing. The the axis is still at 45 degrees. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the tips of the star tetrahedron don't match that 45 degree. That's why they don't overlay because that 60 degree axis is not the scalar grid. It's not the actual energy grid. You know what I'm saying? I'm it's, getting on that, but I, 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 you know, all that is really important to everything, but I just, the, the diagram itself, um, this star tetrahedron, the Merkaba here, I don't believe is, is a Merkaba because like if I- don't, I, I don't believe it is either. I don't believe it is more like, a, like an artistic representation of it, because first right. of all, if it is supposed to be a Merkaba like this, with the, or, then that means that this this orientation, like the vertex is right here and this is right. more like this. So it's not even really oriented the way most people see the Merkaba. Right. And then if it were like this, this then is a, supposed to be a way bigger triangle here right. up above, right. below your right. towards your feet. And see, that, I feel like. I feel like this has to do with, uh, think of it like a computer, right? When you have a certain symbol, it programs the computer. So that's not an actual, like, 
true representation i feel like that was just a programming symbol for the mind because it's it recognizes that shape you know what i'm saying yeah but i don't feel like it was completely accurate you know what i'm saying an accurate yeah, but language. that's the thing that at least i like to address with my sacred geometry maybe right. it's not important for you know the vast majority of other people out there but or i really it is stuff important though. as like, a yeah. kind of template and blueprint that when i look at that diagram and i want to resonate put myself in that diagram you know, and start to right. get my mind's eye activated, the mental body really right. starts to access this material so it starts to speak through you and move through you. Then I had to weed through so much stuff like this, you know, that with the other Metatron's cube. Basically, what I'm saying is like this <laughs> if, if the Metatron's cube and all that was like that, and that was my first introduction to sacred geometry, and I wish that was all nice and smooth and I could just enter into it. And if you're starting something new here, you know, with not new, but you know, with, with this information, this kind of movement with the crystal spiral, then if the diagrams, you don't want to have people work backwards, like years down the road or whatever, to be like, what's going on with this diagram? Because the diagrams totally are agree. meant to, to convey the energetic body to you. Right. Right. And, it, and the fact that it's old and grainy and they're not really updated and it's so extensive, it does make for a very, very cumbersome journey. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's very cumbersome. So, yeah, I feel yeah. like it's our job to update all this. Well, yeah, definitely. You know, I'm working on my end on other things. I think you are way more into this here, but I'm grateful that, you know, you're open to my information. There's so much material out there. I can't imagine you rewrite it all. But if if, if, it is, if it is a value, and I know sacred geometry is of, of importance and value to you, this would, uh, these are just things to either point out in the diagram so people know, right? And right. then it's transparent and say like this orientation here is really an idea concept, right? right. Rather than being the way the geometry all lays out. If that's not true and it is the way it is, well, then that's something I have to look into because I'm not sure exactly right. what it is. But it could be, a perspective thing, whatever, but that's good to know. So people can start to get their frame of reference and orientation to these diagrams. So that's just, uh, it, it's just a little piece that I want to add in there around that. And of course. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm glad you do, bro. Anything that you do that you feel like is important or key. I feel like that too. Like, honestly, everything that you've delved into and then explored and connected, like, I feel like is all very important. And I feel like the diagram should be an accurate rendition or representation of the energy field because that's what makes it sacred is it's exactly. accurate. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like, supposed to be eternal. It's supposed to represent, if, it, exactly. if it's, it's supposed to be eternal, unless Kelantics, I don't know how often they use sacred geometry, but they're using sacred geometry. But those are the things that holds the root two, the root three, all the me sacred measurements, phi ratio, if you get there, like all that's supposed to be in there or can be in there. But if the diagrams right. don't do it, then that's then another phase locking that can happen right. if you're treating the diagram okay. as part of the expansive ma mandala, yantra, you know, expression and all the words and all the things can be there. And if it's not, and it's meant to be just like I said, like a diagram for information and those sort of things. Well, then it's quite simple to say that like it's just a more expressive artistic representation of how these right. things work and the energy body does look like this <laughs> like, right you know. right but i feel so, like see if what if like we were going through a sacred geometry book and it had the in-depth information that Kelantix has as you see like this diagram with the yeah. merkaba it has well this is the particle staff the circulating it the, like that's what i feel like sacred geometry should be explained like should be able to be explained at that level energetically you know stuff like that but the problem with Kelantics is you know it came through a human being you know what I'm saying the information came through a woman and that woman had a personality she had an ego and then unfortunately she the ego, she filtered that information through her perceptual lenses. And some of the information I personally feel is distorted, not fully complete. She purposely didn't cover certain things, covered too much on certain things, skipped other things. So there's a lot of, a lot of, lot of work like that I'm having to do regarding this work because she just didn't do it justice that like she could have focused more on the geometry and math and less opinions about things and things could be a lot more universal you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying but it's 
a lot of dogma and fighting because people have so many little pieces you know what i'm saying so it's like what mm-hmm. we're doing here is our job to show that hey it's all connected it's all the same thing it's just mm-hmm. a matter of perspective it's a matter of which one do you resonate with so yes uh, i appreciate you george and all that you do because it's fantastic work like really yeah well you know she she did um, provide you this gift to work with uh, and definitely introduce some new geometry. You know, it got me into the square view. So many thanks, right. you know, the, the way I call it the square view, that orientation, which was expansive right. for me in my journey. So uh, everybody has those, uh, you know, personality traits that gets woven in. It's as a teacher. That's we what we have to recognize though. We have to recognize that she's not the inventor of the crystal spiral. She's not the inventor of the Cathara. Yeah. She is just a person that the information came through that these are universal, timeless, you know, mechanics and truths. And just because one person didn't fully unfold the three-dimensional view of the geometry doesn't mean that it's not there and doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, you know? So. No, well, certainly not because, you know, as I explored it, I just built the form. So, you know, I mean, that's, how it goes you build off of it and continue on that uh tradition and it, it it came through her just like like you know this this sort of thing comes through me i don't know what it is right. but i'm I, you know, it, I mean i do know what it is you know the pyramid and i'll do another video on this at some time and maybe Good. we'll get to sure. it in a future one. it's definitely a fun one but i think uh that was a fantastic conversation Britt. thanks so much for being like so open and and sharing all your insights and wisdom that you've acquired in your journey with ketolontics uh we wove so many things together there's so many other trails that can be explored there i think it was really motivational for people to uh get interested in sacred geometry a way that they start to engage and apply it within their lives and Britt is a fantastic uh teacher of this so reach out to him i'll put all his information in my uh description here and uh you know if you want to connect with some of the things I've been sharing, I'm doing the same thing. And there are other people out there like it, like us. So just keep on exploring and connecting. And Britt, do you want to say any other four closing words? I think we've had a full session. Oh, yeah, bro. I just want to say thank you for all of you who tuned in. George is a fantastic teacher regarding sacred geometry. And he has wonderful videos before this one. Uh, thank you for your time and your effort. And I honestly look forward to another video with more in-depth connections and more you know unfolding because really that's what people need they just need another perspective on how things are connected so people can experience a higher quality of life a spiritual experience you know it's an emotional connection so thank you for yeah. the work you do appreciate your time yeah. and uh yeah uh i've pretty much set all my piece okay um, man that's awesome yeah you. that's really what it's all about that uh, better qual better connected feeling in life and you described that so well so we will uh look forward to another video and i'm just thankful we really felt like we hope we were going to do some bridge building here between some varied perspectives yeah. and we both are really into two different worlds of sacred geometry man, we are, together we're into- pioneers in our field man for <laughs> real like we really are trailblazing really <laughs> Great. Well, I'm a tracker, so I love to be on the trail, and I'm gr- grateful to have awesome companions along the way who have different perspectives. So much love, right. Britt, and uh, thank you all for viewing. I hope you all enjoyed that very much. Look forward to some more connection with us. All right. Peace, everyone.